So a good morning to the YouTube audience and also another good morning to my in-person audience and good morning to those of you who are on the live stream. I often attend to calendar when I uh, open and then I look at the YouTube and I realize they put the date on the YouTube thing so um, people know the day of the chapel service, I don't need to say it, except that it's especially relevant today for two reasons. Today happens to be the national observance of Father's Day and also, uh, as many of you may not realize, but today um, at 11.30 in the Northern Hemisphere is the summer solstice. So uh, today is the longest uh, daylight day of the year and about 15 hours of sunlight, which affects my mood dramatically. And there are people for whom these events, solstice, equinox, and the midpoints in between are viewed as sacred interval points in the, um, in the year. And if you look at many of the wisdom traditions of the world, they often um, interestingly position uh, festivals in times of either darkness or light or fall or spring. So um, I want to speak just a minute about the occasion of Father's Day because for one, both Father's Day and Mother's Day have been challenging days for me in my journey of preaching um, because I come out of a family system that was um, in many ways very, very profoundly affected by the disease of alcoholism. And um, I both adore and love my parents, and I have gone through phases in my recovery where I have really criticized them, even in public speech and discourse. And um, I'm a little bit now long into my recovery, kind of like wanting to figure out where to go with that. So I'd like to begin with just a moment of tribute to my dad, who I loved and adored and admired. I'm named after him, even though I was the fourth of the five kids. I'm a John Jr. And, um, and my dad was an awesome fellow. And he died when I was 21. And his death was definitely contributed to by his smoking, uh, uh, chronic pain, uh, opioid use, and alcohol ingestion even though we didn't necessarily do an autopsy and he didn't avail himself of much treatment. So great guy, I miss him terribly, and um, I inherited a lot of his stuff, good and bad. I am gonna use a story about my mom, if I can, on Father's Day. Um, and I don't mean to just diss my dad that way, um, but it's a, it's a story that fits my theme. I probably could come up with a story about my dad and the theme for today if I really worked hard on it. But anyway, I wanted to tell you about a story about my mom, um, who, uh, so at least it's parent related. Um, and I don't want to belabor these points too much. So my mom also suffered from alcohol use disorder. And especially in 1982 when my dad died, my mother's alcoholism got much worse. So my mother had gone from sort of some degree of containment of her drinking, like I called my parents Dick Van Dyke alcoholics, like they kept jobs and fed the kids and did all that sort of stuff, but boy, like uh, five o'clock was the sacred hour in which the children were not supposed to mess with them because the order of the moment was to drink. And uh, unless you wanted to drink with them. And so, uh, you know, you were happy to get a cocktail and that's where partly I learned to drink, trying to be an adult, having cocktails with my parents. And um, anyway, my mom's drinking escalates precipitously in 1982. And uh, eventually, my sister invites my mother and all of us to participate in an intervention with mom. And my mother goes to treatment. And almost immediately after treatment starts drinking again, which is not terribly uncommon, especially uh, in those days. And the treatment that my mother was offered the first time, I would say, was routine, but not robust and rich. And so as the story continues for my mom, uh, her health degrades further, her drinking is worse and worse, and members of my family abdicate. Like, they're like, I'm out, I won't do anything. So eventually, around 1992, I was coming into my early sobriety, and I staged a second intervention with the help of a woman who used to work here and passed away just recently, who also I'd like to name and tribute because she was awesome, uh, Barbara Teal. So Barb Teal, who was a breakthrough therapist here, helped me get my mother uh, a treatment uh, stay at another treatment center, not here, but my mom went to a fancy treatment place in the desert southwest in 1992, approximately, and um, only I and one of my siblings um, 
and my mom's only like really good friend and a doctor and a, and a, and a therapist participated in this intervention. So she had burned a bunch of bridges. And um, we were quite surprised when the treatment center called us and said, you know, we would like everybody who's living in the family, which at that time there were four of us, four children, my dad was already gone, uh, to come out to the desert southwest and do a week of family treatment. And we were like, hey, we didn't sign up for that. Like, fix mom, don't make us come. But uh, sure enough, what happened was three of us uh, flew in to the nearest airport, and one of us came separately um, with a separate car and fled the scene early. He, he ran away when we tried to intervene on him, although later he would get sober. But the three of us who were not drinking at that time uh, flew into uh, an airport, rented a tiny little uh, the equivalent of like a Prius or something like that uh, today. I remember this tiny little rental car. I, I remember joking as we were heading up in the mountains, I felt like the it was running on a rubber band and I was waiting for it to break as we were climbing the hills. And as we got to the gate of this treatment center, there was a sign, welcome to, I'll call it Sunny Acres, it wasn't Sunny Acres, but welcome to Sunny Acres Treatment Center, expect a miracle was the line on the sign. And like a woman out there, uh, I was like, really? That's an ambitious claim. And uh, I was, because I was really skeptical. I had gone from staunch atheist to inquiring agnostic. At that point, I was what I would call an inquiring agnostic. And I really would have told you I didn't believe in the miraculous. And I was pretty sure I didn't believe in the divine, whatever that would mean. And, um, and I was, Actually, I was angry at my mother. I was an angry dude, and I was angry that I had had to interrupt my life and come out to this place, and I was sort of excited to have my two siblings in this crazy little car, and I was waiting for my other sibling to arrive. And I had no idea what I was in for, because even though I was in my recovery, I had not gone to treatment myself. So we get to this treatment center. We're going through this week, and um, we have this unbelievable experience. And um, I'm going to revisit that story at the end of the message. But that week changed my life. It changed my mother's life. It changed the, the, the other brother who drives in separately. It, it would change his life. It changed all of our lives. And um, about two years later, my mother would die of lung cancer. But she died sober. And, um, and her entire story is different because of her experience of going to this Sunny Acres place. So my subject for today, I'm going to label Quantum Change, borrowing the title of a book that I just read recently. Um, normally when I hit this theme um, in my little calendar of themes, I just call it change. Sometimes I call it transformation. But there was a book written not too long ago, uh, I think in, about three or four years ago, by a guy named Bill Miller, and uh, one of my clinical heroes, who um, is a therapist and has helped a lot of us who, who work in the field of addiction disorders. So Bill Miller writes this book about changes in human beings that are dramatic and sort of instantaneous. And he uses, he uses the term quantum change to talk about a phenomenon in physics where a light can strike an electron particle and it's the particle will change state instantaneously. It will go from state A to state C with no B in between. And uh, physics struggles to explain how the, the electron moves from this orbit to that orbit without being able to track the movement of the electron in a discrete, continuous way in all those intervals. So this quantum state change is a phenomenon that we observe in the natural world. And we observe it in people, too. right? So one of Bill Miller's examples is Ebenezer Scrooge, right? And, um, uh, and, and I don't know if you've ever had the Scrooge moment in your life, or um, one of my favorite characters in literature is King Lear. I studied the Shakespeare play uh, in depth, and it's, um, it's a play I return to over and over again in my life and think about it in different ways now as an older man. I read it first when I was 16. But Lear goes through a profound change. And many characters, and many, many stories, many movies, are about extraordinary changes. And the cynical young man who was taking his mom to treatment, except he was always bidding his mom to treatment, I really was skeptical about profound change. I really didn't know if, like the old leopard doesn't change its spots, which turns out to be a biblical reference, by the way, from Jeremiah. Um, 
I, I kind of subscribe to that idea. Oh, uh, well, leopard doesn't change the spots, you know, like so. Uh, once a drinker, always a drinker. I was, I was pretty cynical about this expect a miracle sort of notion. But Bill Miller inter and his co-author, DeBaca is part of the last name. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to botch that last name. But anyway, it's a co-authored book where they offer a proposal and an analysis of a bunch of people's stories that are testimonies to change. There's also a book that was written by Chris Kennedy Lawford, a member of the Kennedy family. I don't know if any of you know of Chris, but he was a, uh, he died not too long ago. A uh, really cool fellow, helped Karen out at one period of time, and a member of the historic American Kennedy family. And um, Chris Kennedy Lawford wrote a book called Moments of Clarity. And, and the expression Moments of Clarity is kind of a recovery expression. So there are a lot of people who will tell you that they are sober today, and they will recall a moment of clarity. I can recall a moment of clarity which involved falling off of a bar stool and puking, and then waking up the next morning and remembering the embarrassment of like, it. Like, Oh no, I'm becoming my mother. It was, not a, it was not a very flattering moment of clarity, but I'm wondering if you have one. And anyway, here's the question is, did your moment of clarity correlate with a profound change? Hmm, we're hoping that the, the jury's still up since you're sitting here, right? And I want to talk about that, and I want to tell you some things about what Miller says about quantum change based on his many interviews. And then I want to turn the story back on you, and then I want to finish with a recollection of my driving into the treatment center experience. So when Bill Miller and his co-author investigate the stories of people who have these moments of clarity, not just addiction, but just where their lives, they went from you know, jerk to nice person, or they went from lost to found, or they went from sort of blind to seeing, went from captive to free, went from trauma survivor to thriver, went to, you know, like, all these testimonies went from uh, ineffectual and failure to launch to people who had successful and effective lives. There's all kinds of ways in which people get stuck and then can become unstuck. And um, so two different sort of watersheds that Miller observed and four different characteristics are uh, the key findings of, if you read the book. So the first thing that Miller and his co-author noted was that if you interview people who have these testimonies to extraordinary change, they don't always totally rigorously fall into two camps, but the two camps that they use are fancy words. Uh, those of you who know me know I like fancy words, but I also am asked frequently to explain them. So let me give you the fancy words and I'll explain them. So numinous and noetic. So I won't raise, ask you to raise hands and say if you know those two words, but they're, they're big theology words. So if you go to a seminary, you learn the word numinous from Rudolf Otto in the 1920s and uh, noetic you learn uh, in scripture studies. Because noetic is related to the word gnosis, which is a Greek word about knowledge. And so what, what and numinous is uh, related to an ancient word that has to do with holy or mystery or sacred, like a woo woo kind of thing. So in the categories of moments of clarity in which people's lives dramatically change, you have some that are like, aha, light bulb, insight, you know, insight driven changes. And then you have some that are like, zap, you know, whoa, wow, how did that happen? Sort of like the person goes through the door and they come out, uh, you know, transformed and there's a mystery and a sizzle and a wow and a weirdness to it. And as Bill Miller notes in the, in the, chapter that he writes about this division, he says they, they get fuzzy after the fact. Because if you have a noetic transformation, then you think about how mysterious it was after the fact. And if you have a mysterious transformation, you, 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 you might, might, might spend the next years of your life trying to gain insight into what it is. So it's not like either one stays completely divorced from the other. But it, but it is, there's a sort of a feel when you ask a person to tell the story I'm hoping that our musicians who are just playing will eventually have a story of testimony and that maybe one of those two musicians who just played that beautiful music for us would talk about how they had gone to a particular talk or done an exercise or had this profound insight and then found the craving was gone and they achieved long-term sobriety and they restored their family relationships forever and that would be a noetic one. And then the other person would be like, I don't know what the heck happened, but I was walking along Magic Mountain and all of a sudden I saw a squirrel and like, I, you know, we have a person who's uh, connected to the Karen story, uses the squirrel 
citing as a uh, as a transformational moment. I'm always a little. I'm still cynical and skeptical about this, and I'm a practitioner who's trying to induce it. So I can like, if, if you're not skeptical, I'm like, uh, I, I don't know why. But anyway, this notion that the two kinds is, I think, illuminating. The other thing that I think is illuminating about the change is what he says are the four characteristics that kind of are hallmarks of whether you really had this happen or not. And one is that the, the memory of the transformation is quite vivid and intense. So if you don't have a story of transformation, maybe you don't have a transformation. Maybe you make an incremental course correction or something like that. But, but if, if, if your life hasn't dramatically changed and you can't like point to like, well, sort of weirdly, this is the beginning, my sobriety date is a dramatic change. January 3rd, 1989, I told you I have a bit of a, an awakening moment. Just the weekend before that it was the New Year's weekend that I found myself puking in a bar and waking up the next morning and thinking, oh my God, I'm becoming my mom. And, um, and so that's part of the quality of the experience. So vivid and um, intense is part of it. A second uh, quality to it is surprising. Like, not the kind of thing that you were necessarily expecting. So it catches you somewhat off guard to some degree. Even if, I mean, you came to treatment, but many people come to treatment just thinking, ah, this is just treatment. Or, uh, and that's actually a clue to where you're thinking. If you use minimizing and reductionist and sort of containing language for what you're thinking about as Karen, I would warn you against that because you're closing your door to the miracle before it even happens. If you're like, I'm only here for 28 days, and I just came here for the weed, or I just came here for the blah, blah, blah. When you use that just and only language, you are narrowing your field of view and kind of closing your mind. And there's a classic AA expression which speaks into that, which is the alcoholic looks at a burning bush and says, God, will you show me a real sign? Like, you might be missing the miracle or trying to talk yourself out of it. So vivid, surprising, benevolent. So we don't want to have Scrooge go from nice guy to jerk, right? So what we're talking about is an improvement, a positive sort of transformation. So we're not trying to make you all into sociopaths. We're trying to help reduce your sociopathy features. And, and this is a good thing that we're now are our conversation together is, is seeking to hold in view. And the last characteristic, which is quite important, is persisting. So not only does the memory and the intensity and the benevolence persist, but the actual transformation sticks. So you, 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 know, you might have um, in a way, oh, I need to get together. I need to get my act together about my finances. And you might start trying to spend differently. And then you find out that Monday and Tuesday is Amazon Prime Day. And the next thing you know, you're like, out, out, you know, out thousands of dollars and that box is showing up that you didn't mean to and, and, and the change that you intended was not persisting. So it turns out you didn't have a quantum state change that you had hoped for. So if you, like me, are skeptical or uncertain about these things, one of the things I do want to say is that, first of all, when Bill Miller and his co-author went on a radio show and on a radio show said, hey, we're going to research this topic. If there are people out there in the listening audience who have experienced profound change, here's a phone number to call when we want to collect your stories. In weeks, they had thousands of volunteers. So, um, and, and many people think addiction is really hard to treat, but I just learned an interesting statistic, which is that comparison with other behavioral health disorders, actually addiction has better outcomes than any other thing. So this is actually a quite treatable concern that you come here for. And if you really still don't believe in this, I would encourage you to go to recovery communities, go to recovery garment, go to Alcoholics Anonymous, go to Narcotics Anonymous, and, or come and work here for a little while. And what you will see is over and over again, people experiencing quantum change. I have to tell you, it's routine here. When I was a pastor in churches, I wanted it to happen in like a much greater frequency than it actually does in local churches, which might be one of the reasons why local churches are not thriving, one of many. But 
there is testimony to this quantum change, and there's testimony to it in basically like every wisdom tradition in all categories of literature and the arts. You have all kinds of stories, all kinds of places to look, and if you're looking, if you want to look in Judaism or Hinduism or Buddha, Buddhism or uh, Islam, like there, there, there are stories in those traditions. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad's story is a story of profound change. The Buddhist story is a profound, profound change story. Uh, the character Abram in the Hebrew tradition experiences profound change. Like this, this is the stuff of human beings' great storytelling. And one of the reasons why you have stories like Scrooge and Paul on the road to Damascus. Um, who was briefly struck, struck blind as part of the, the, the mystery of that story. Um, this does happen. And I apologize in one sense for returning, but I want to return to what I was saying. I jumped ahead in my mental outline. I, I want to challenge you to understand that you have some responsibility in regards to this. I cannot tell you exactly which book to read or what squirrel to look for or, or, or where to go to make this woo-woo happen, but I can tell you that if you have an attitude that is so closed-minded to it that you absolutely believe it can happen, I'm pretty sure it won't happen. And I think people talk themselves out of change all the time, out of this persisting pessimism and this defeatism and out of the wounding of the trauma of their lives. So don't let the hurts that have been inflicted on you in the past continue to win the day by telling you a lie that you can't get better. Because that is the, that, that, that pisses me off. Like do not let people who perpetrated violence or horrible things against you in the past lure you into some story that you can't get better. I do not believe that for a second. But I have watched patients who get in their own way of getting well and watch the treatment team spin its wheels trying to help that patient, trying to help that patient way more than the patient, and the patient blowing up every solution that's put in front of them. So I, I think that's the question is will you open your heart and your mind to the possibility of a miracle? In 1992, on the Friday of that week, it had been Monday to Friday, my mother had disclosed to me things about her and to us as a family, things about her that made me understand how she had ended up being the woman she was, both the amazing woman she was and the drinker that she was. And this is always, there's always a developmental story. You have a story that would make your addiction make complete sense. Now, my mom had a, a story that made the thing I was so mad at her about make complete sense. So I found empathy and compassion for my mom. And I found a new freedom in that that was extraordinarily helpful. My brother, who fled because we did an intervention on him in the middle of family week, and he was like, screw you, I'm out of here. Twelve years later, we get sober. So, and, 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 and in his testimony in Alcoholics Anonymous, he would talk about how 12 years prior to this sobriety, his family had intervened on him, but he ran away. So don't be my brother, please. Because 12 years was too long to wait. And unfortunately, Steve, after 15 years of sobriety, was killed in a tragic motorcycle accident, so that don't happen anymore with me. So on that Friday, I get in my car, get in the rubber band vehicle to take it back to the airport with my sister and my brother, not the brother who fled, but my other sister and brother. And I'm pulling out, and the back of the sign says, you are the miracle. And I'll never forget it. I really believe you can be. And I hope you will find your noetic or numinous moment and be able to come back someday and get a coin here and tell us how your life changed on the solstice Father's Day in 2021 as COVID relaxation spread across the land. A uh, celebration of change.
tribute to those who have not been able to make it, maybe even our parents. It has been a pleasure to be with you and share with us on the YouTube audience. Thank you.